some relationships come into our lives and last a long time, and others are brief, but teach us a lot. Today, I want to talk to you a little bit about the latter for me. My first real adult relationship happened with a woman named Janice. Uh, we met at church, ironically, uh, and we saw each other just for the summer. She was 29 and I was 22. It was the summer after college. I was still a kid, especially in terms of relationships. She seemed so grown up. She had a job and everything. Well, as I say, mature relationships were a bit of a novel idea for me at the time. Other than a brief girlfriend in high school, this was really one of my first relationships. And, and there was a heck of a lot more to it than passing notes in study hall. Yet, that was basically all I had to go on. You see, I called Janice all the time. Since it was summer, my schedule was free, things were happening in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So I was asking her to go out, have fun, chill. And when I say always, I mean always. Far too much every day, as a matter of fact. If you've ever seen that scene in the movie Swingers where John Favreau keeps calling a woman over and over again after getting her number, that was me. I cringed a little bit when I first saw that scene. To say I was clingy and overbearing would be kind of an understatement. Obviously, this worked out about as well for me as it did for John Favreau in Swingers. Eventually, Janice said she needed space to be her own person. I was suffocating her. I was upset, of course, but we parted as friends, and we actually have been ever since. Well, as I said, there's some relationships that are long-lasting, and there are others that are brief, but teach you a lot. Janice taught me a lot, though I didn't know it so well at the time, nursing my broken heart. I learned that a relationship is a coming together of, of two individual people. It is not the melding of two personalities into one two-headed monster. We cannot sacrifice who we are as people for the sake of the other, nor should we ask them to do that for us. Which pretty much sums up the moral of the parable of the stranger on the bridge in our reading today. The stranger hands the man the other end of the rope and then jumps off. In the relationship between the two of them, which is what the rope represents, the man holding the rope is doing all of the work, while the stranger dangling on the end over the abyss is doing nothing for the relationship at all. Other than, I guess, a kind of passive aggressive comment that my life is in your hands. Key to the story, I think, is the beginning, the preamble. The man comes to the bridge at a point in his life where he knows who he is and he knows who he is not. He is a full person, whole and healthy. And thus, when it comes time to problem solve how to get out of this situation, the man holding the rope is the only one trying. He has ideas and vision for how this relationship can move forward in a healthy way, each one of them taking some of the responsibility and doing their part. Unfortunately, the stranger dangling at the end of the rope only sees this relationship from his perspective. He is not aware or chooses not to see how this relationship is a burden to the other. After trying to have a rational conversation about their conundrum, the man on the bridge must abandon the stranger. He has to walk away in order to be who he is. Note that this was not his first choice. Some may have just let the rope go right away and gone their merry way. But the man tried to be in relationship with the stranger. He tried to define some boundaries and parameters for how that could work. You climb up and I'll pull. We'll work together on this. It's, it's workable, but we both have to try. Ed Friedman, who calls this dynamic over-functioning and under-functioning. The stranger who uh, jumped over the bridge wants to do as little as possible regarding this relationship. He is under-functioning. He expects the man on the bridge to do everything for him in the relationship, to be the one who is over-functioning. In Chris Rock's new comedy special entitled Tambourine, 
he makes a similar observation. He notes that two people can move a couch pretty easily. One person by themselves, it's nearly impossible. Relationships are easy if both people work at it. They're nearly impossible if one person is in it all by themselves. Another common problem is of being stuck together by a rope, visible or invisible. Social psychologists call this enmeshment. And enmeshment is when two people are in a relationship and they're so closely tied together that they can't tell where one ends and the other begins. That was the sort of relationship I wanted with Janice, one where she and I were tied together and we had no differentiation between her and myself. It's when one person is angry, the other one has to be angry. If one votes Republican, the other has to vote Republican. There can be no daylight between them in this enmeshed relationship. Now, eventually, of course, one personality comes to dominate the other. One person loses themselves in the morass, the quagmire that is the admixture of their two selves. At some point, this becomes untenable, but I have seen and heard of relationships that are enmeshed, that go on for years and decades. Well, what to do about this? Believe it or not, that these two unhealthy dy dynamics of enmeshment on the one hand and over under functioning on the other have similar solutions. System theorists who have studied families as complex emotional systems have given us a uh, vocabulary, if you will, to help understand these things. The answer they pre present and the one that they coach their clients in, uh, who are caught up in these dynamics, is to define a self. That's the answer, to define a self. In other words, to say who you are and who you are not. What are you willing to do in this relationship and what won't you do? That you wish to continue to be in relationship with the other and still be an independent person on your own. That's what it means to have healthy boundaries. It is hard to strike that balance between working with the other person to be in relationship so you can move a couch when you need to without becoming one big ball of mush that has to do everything together all of the time. Healthy relationships are ones that can strike the balance between those two opposing forces to get the best of both, a whole person in relationship with another whole person. And if you're thinking, easier said than done, Reverend Josh, I wholeheartedly agree. However, we are not without hope. One of the best examples I know of someone defining a self being willing to let go of that rope if it means being the one who has to do it all, uh, all the work, was our special music today. In that song, Sarah Barella sings, who cares if you disagree? You are not me. Who made you king of anything? You dare tell me who to be? Who died and made you king of anything? Her, her mansplaining boyfriend at the beginning desires to assert his will upon her. He's got the talking down, but not the listening, she says. He's the one expecting enmeshment. She will do as he wills. The chorus is her response, her assertion of a self pushing back against that overbearing personality that wants her to conform. You are not me. That defines a self. You dare tell me who to be? He wants her to think the same way she he does, to be an extension of him rather than her own person. And as the video progress, as progresses and she asserts herself apart from him, she comes to life. The colors go from black and white while they're talking in that diner to the vibrant colors of the flower garden. She is blooming. That's what Ed Friedman is trying to tell us in this parable. A little more about Edwin Friedman, or should I say, Rabbi Edwin Friedman. He served a large Jewish congregation in the Washington, D.C. area. Somewhere mid-career, he just wasn't feeling it anymore. 
he decided he really liked counseling without the stress of leading a large congregation. And so he went back to school and learned about how to be a family therapist. And there he studied under a man named Murray Bowen, who was kind of the pioneer in coming up with uh, applying systems theory to families as a way to help them. And it's Bowen who coined some of these terms we use, like over and under, fun, under functioning. But Rabbi Friedman noticed something. Congregations, like families, are complex emotional systems. Maybe not as tight, but they do mimic families in some regards. Perhaps applying the methods of systems theory for families would work in addressing things like church conflict or burnout among lay leaders. Well, it turns out Friedman's hunch was correct. Enmeshment happens in churches and synagogues as surely as it does in families. Ever have the feeling like you have to do something by consensus, vote the same way everyone else does at the congregational meetings so that we can all go along to get along? That's what enmeshment feels like in church. Ever been on a committee or doing a project where it seems like you're doing all the work and all the other people are slacking off because they know you're going to pick it up? You're overfunctioning while they're underfunctioning. You're the one holding on to the rope while they dangle over the side. You're trying to move a couch all by yourself. And while the problems are similar, so too is the answer. It is just as important to define a self at church, to say who you are, what you need, how much of yourself you can reasonably give to the collective effort. So we do this in various ways. We have things like committee job descriptions. They define what we can do as a team and what we can't. Naming expectations we have for staff and ministers is another example of doing something similar. Churches have strategic plans and goals. They assert a self by naming how are we going to focus our resources and articulating the overall vision we intend to accomplish. So a good strategic plan has only a few goals. It ensures that those things will get accomplished because we're going to say no to the other things that could knock us off our game and distract us from what's really important. Now, some of you may have been a part of the, the Healthy, Con Healthy Boundaries workshop that uh, we had a couple weeks back where we talked about some of this. Having healthy boundaries is kind of a, a synonym for what I'm calling defining a self that's also in relationship. You can think of those two, two ideas as interchangeable, really. You accomplish that self-definition by articulating your boundaries. We do this in our romantic relationships, with our friends, with our families, and yes, we have to define boundaries at church as well. Perhaps the best example of healthy boundaries is a covenant. A covenant says, this is how we will be in relationship with each other as members of this church. A creed, on the other hand, creeds are a form of enmeshment. Creeds say, we can only be in relationship together if we all believe the same things. Our free church tradition counters that by asserting that our beliefs are important, but they are secondary to our relationships with each other. Our covenant is a tool that helps us to define a self to have healthy boundaries within our congregation. One of my favorite parts of that workshop was the introduction of the idea of 100 yeses. We may be asked to eh, compromise our boundaries, to be either enmeshed with someone or to enter into one of those over or under functioning relationships. And tentatively at first, perhaps not understanding what we're getting into, we go along. We vote with the crowd. We raise our hand to volunteer for things more and more. Others learn that if they stay silent for a little bit, then someone else will volunteer for that. Little by little, it happens. The first 10 times, we say yes, they are benign, but soon a head of steam builds up, and before you know it, you can't do anything but go along with the group, or else maybe you can't be in the group, or before you know it, you are the only one doing the work of five different committees, and everyone else is having, hanging back knowing you have all the bases covered. How many couches can you juggle all by yourself? You, my friend, have said yes too many times. You are 100 yeses in at this point, and before you know it, you will do anything to get out of those unhealthy relationships. 
that's when boundary crossing can turn into boundary violation. And we must be ever vigilant. Consider raccoons, for example. They're cute, they're cuddly looking. There's Rocket Raccoon and Guardians of the Galaxy and the Avengers. Everybody loves him. But are they really that lovable? Raccoons are actually kind of mean. Despite their good PR, raccoons are vicious, especially in the daytime. They carry diseases and they cross boundaries by getting into other people's trash. Possums, on the other hand, may not be much to look at. They keep to themselves and when in danger, play dead rather than attack. They are misunderstood. Possums hold tight to their offspring in their pouch. Their capacity to love is strong. And they help others. Possums eat ticks and other pests, which keep the ecosystem in balance. They have a defined self of who they are and who they are not. Covenants help us to become more possum-like at church, open to being in loving relationships while enhancing the other at the same time. Now, covenants are not magic. Just writing one and pasting it on the wall is a necessary, but not sufficient task. You enter into the free church tradition of our religious ancestors only when we live out our covenant. We do so when we think about it, speak about it, speak it aloud to each other, and take it seriously. We strive to live according to the vision that we have for our relationship together. And when we fail to do so, for we will fail to do so, all of us, we begin again in love. We listen non-defensively to others who, with grace and forgiveness, call us back to our best selves. That's how a covenant works, how it defines a self, and how a church lives out its calling as literally the beloved community. A community that loves each other without expecting to become one great big ball of mush. But it takes communication and a lot of deep listening to get there. Aha, our theme for the month returns. We can only live out our covenant if we are both listening and talking. We can't assume that everyone's gonna go along with my point of view. We have to speak it aloud and allow others to define themselves for or against it according to their free will and to be okay with either choice they make. So that when we disagree on our beliefs, we are not abandoning our relationship as, church, as a church. That's what a creed does. A covenant puts our relationship ahead of our differences, in what we might think about theology or, or some other topic. It's a high calling to live out our church's covenant, which allows us to be the diverse group we are. It is way easier, but also way crueler just to kick people out who don't agree with us. That's never been who we are as Unitarian Universalists. May we strive to have healthy relationships in our lives. Let us be bold in our vision to assert who we are. Let us listen in love to who others are. May our covenant come to life in our hearts and in our lives together. I love you. Go in peace. Amen. I invite you now to join in singing our final hymn, number 1021, Lean on Me. The words will appear on your screen.